I am Matthew Bowman, and you're listening to Gospel Tangent. It's the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. And for his daily Mormon history podcast, I'm Rick Benham. I'm excited to have Matt Bowman on the show. You know, he's the head of graduate studies at Claremont Graduate University. But uh, people may know him better for his writings on Mormon Bigfoot. So we're going to talk about that for sure, as well as his latest book, which is on UFOs. How does that relate to spirituality? We'll talk about the uh, rise of the nuns or the spiritually but not religious. And Matt says that's actually not a step away from religion. It's a step toward religion for certain people. So this is a fantastic conversation. You won't want to miss it. Check it out. Welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have one of the premier Mormon historians uh, on the show. Could you go ahead and tell us who you are? That is generous of you, Rick. Um, <laughs> I'm Matthew Bowman. I'm the Howard W. Hunter Chair of Mormon Studies at Claremont Graduate University. Um, I'm an Associate Professor of History and Religion there. It's been way too long that we haven't had Matt Bowman on. Um, you just, let's see, can we say retired? Is that the right word? As the Chair of Mor the Mormon History Association? Uh, well, I wouldn't say retired. I'd say rotated out. Um, <laughs> I served as president of the Mormon History Association until the last meeting in Rochester, New York, and then uh, a new president took over at uh, that meeting. That was kind of funny because there was some turmoil before you got in there. You kind of got thrown to the wolves a little there bit. There was, yeah. You know, we had a couple of presidents prior to myself um, who were supposed to be the president for that meeting. You know, the presidents serve for a year until the um, annual meeting that they preside over. And then at the end of that annual meeting, they hand it off to the next president. Uh, the two presidents who, well, there was one president who was elected to serve. He had to step down for family reasons. And the next, same issue, actually ran into some health problems. And so I did take over at kind of the very last moment. But, you know, honestly, it was easier than you might think because those two um, presidents did a lot of the groundwork. This Rochester conference was supposed to happen in 2020. It was the 200th anniversary of the First Vision. And so the executive directors, um, well, Christine Blythe, who served as a executive director for me, but Barbara Jones Brown as well, who was executive director, who planned that initial 2020 conference, they had done so much of the groundwork that it was actually not terribly hard. Yeah. Well, thank you, COVID. That was terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I got lucky because the John Whitmer Historical Association was the fall before 2020, 2019. Right. And so we got to go, and the idea was MHA was going to fall right up, and then COVID hit and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. took yeah, what, four years all, to come back? It, yeah, I guess, yeah, three. Yeah, it was, uh, boy, yeah, it was, it was jerry-rigged for a little while there. But I'm glad to say I think MHA came through the whole thing um, really well. You know, the Rochester Conference had far more registration than we thought it would. Um, yeah. It was maybe people were just hungry to come back. And I'm glad they did. Yeah, it was kind of nice to have a four-year break after all, but uh, it was fun. I mean, it, I, I don't know. I'm Like you, I'm, an, I'm a history nerd, so it, it was a blast. Mm, LMHA so. is always great. It's a good time. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about next year, who's going to be the president, and where is it? Yeah, so uh, the person who took over for me is David Howlett. Um, he uh, is a PhD in religious studies, author of a really, really great book on the history of the Kirtland Temple and the mm -hmm. uses of the Kirtland Temple. Um, appropriately, he is going to be presiding over a conference in Kirtland, Ohio. Yeah, yeah, Cleveland slash Kirtland, yeah, yeah. so people before. Uh, you know, the, the, the real hope, right, is that we could find a venue um, close enough to, the, uh, to Kirtland proper and to the temple that there can be some conference events there. Um, that's proving a bit difficult, but I do think MHA will be um, at Kirtland proper for at least part of the conference. Okay. There will so be some events there. Most people will probably fly into Cleveland, though. That's my like guess. a half hour, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. roughly. So, and, and David's a member of the Community of Christ. Yes. He's another person that I really need to get on my podcast. So, David, if you're listening, 
<laughs> uh, you can buttonhole him at that conference. <laughs> so. Well, I didn't get you because I was afraid you were too busy. Isn't the president <laughs> usually too busy to do that? The president is running all over the place. Yeah, yeah that is absolutely true. But, you know, as soon as um, that last plenary session happens and the one president hands it off to the other, you're just the responsibilities are out of your hands. All right. So try to get him right at the tail end. <laughs> okay. I'll talk to you. We'll see you, David. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I always like to get people's educational background, and you're a Utah man. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Where, where did you get your bachelor's, master's, PhD? All I stuff? went to the University of Utah for mm -hmm. my bachelor's degree. I went to Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Oh, for my is. PhD. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah, it was, it's a PhD really in American history, 19th to 20th century American history with an emphasis on religion. Okay. Was Paul Reeve there when you were a student? No, uh, Paul and I um, overlapped just a little bit. He, he graduated with his PhD right about the time I started. At as Georgetown? An as an, oh, no, at University of Utah as an oh, okay. undergraduate. Then he returned to the University of Utah to join the faculty right about the time yeah, that's I right. left to go to I was, was going to be scared there because I was like, did Paul go to Georgetown? I didn't know oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's mm. cool. Paul's been on the show twice. I love mm -hmm. Paul. He, yeah, he's Paul's great. great. So, um, you're in town because I think there was a uh, meeting of all the Mormon history chairs. Is that right? There was, yes. Can you tell week. us anything more about oh, that? Oh, boy. You know, it was... Yeah, it was a really good idea, actually. Um, Keith Erickson at the Church History Library proposed this to the chairs. And um, we know th there are four of us, myself, Paul, um, at the University of Utah, Patrick Mason at Utah State University, and, of course, Kathleen Flick at the University of Virginia. Um, Keith Erickson, um, who was at the Church History Library, um, contacted all of us and suggested this. We had never actually done this sort of thing before. Yeah. So is uh, this like correlation or something? No, no, no. It was, <laughs> it was really, a, I think, um, just getting us all in the same room and talking a little bit about our different programs and what we do, trying to find some ways we might collaborate um, in the future, and, and particularly, I think, how the church history department might support us. And oh, you know, okay. they were really um, great there. I think, you know, for instance, you know, I teach primarily graduate students, master's and PhD students who are beginning to dip their toes into doing primary source research, who mm -hmm. are trying to produce original scholarship. Um, and the church history department is really working hard, I think, to digitize a lot of their materials, to make more stuff readily available. Um, and trying to find ways in which my students who are in Southern California can get access to stuff in Salt Lake City um, was a really fruitful conversation. So I think there will be some visits um, that they will make either digitally or in person down to my program and we'll find ways to kind of put my students more directly in touch. You know, when I was a graduate student, and I think this is still true for my students as well, staring down an archive and just thinking, like, what do I, where do I even start? You know, I'm interested in, I don't know, maybe I have maybe a student who's interested in researching the history of the Young Women's Program, right? You just go to the catalog and type in Young Women's and then you get 40,000 hits. And, you know, how do you kind of narrow this down? But that's what archivists are for, right? You're supposed to be able to go to an archivist to say, I am interested in the history of the Young Women's, um, say, I don't know, like the uh, Young Women's Mutual Activities. And they will say, well, here is this collection and this collection and this collection. And you know, they really give you a jump start on your research. So oh, okay. hopefully we'll be able to do some of that. Well, now I know I, I just was talking to Rick Turley and Barbara Jones-Brown. Mm -hmm. was surprised to hear that the John D. Lee collection or, or diaries were at the Huntington Library. Is that close to you at Claremont? Yeah, the Huntington Library is about 30 miles down the road from okay. us. And they have a very, very strong 19th century uh, Mormon collection which does surprise a lot of people. But, you know, the Huntington Library specializes in the history of the American West, the history of the Pacific, and so they've been gathering a lot of this for quite a while. That is actually where, as you may have discussed, um, Juanita Brooks did a lot of her work on the Mountain Meadows Massacre right. at Huntington. They've got the Oliver Cowdery letter books um, there as well, as you say, the John D. Lee stuff, so a lot of, a lot of really valuable material. Well, and I know Todd Compton spent uh, an mm -hmm. internship at uh, the Huntington Library, and that's where he got his uh, book on polygamy. Why can't I remember the name? Yeah, Sacred Loneliness. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, precisely. So, yeah, you know, some of my, now many of my students, I think, um, perhaps because, you know, 
myself and Patrick Mason are, are primarily historians of kind of the later er- period, post-Civil War. Um, so I don't have as many students doing kind of our 19th century history as I might like, but oh. you, know, you would think the Huntington would attract some of them. Yeah, well, very good. And it seemed, oh, I was talking to you last week, I think it was, and um, there's some third convention stuff that Claremont has. Is that right? Can you yeah, talk about yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. So there is a really a wonderful little museum in Provo, Utah, called the Museum of Mormon Mexican History, which is founded and operated uh, by Fernando and Enriqueta Gomez. Fernando um, was a, he's an emeritus general authority, he's a formal temple president, and these two have devoted their retirement to gathering materials uh, about the history of various branches of, of Mormonism um, for this museum. Yeah. And they, boy, over the past 20 years, they've gotten such an incredible collection. Um, we've recently partnered with them, both to kind of bolster um, their profile and help them do their work, but they've been very generous as well in, in contributing um, to the Claremont Mormon Studies program. They donated about 80 linear feet of material. That's how archivists measure material. You just line it up, and however long <laughs> all these pieces of paper are, that's what you call it. So it's about 80 linear feet worth wow. of material. Um, a lot of photographs, um, a lot of documents, um, just an incredible collection to our Mormon Cities program. And I've had a number of students who've been working to catalog this. Um, much of it has been digitized. It's up on our websites now. Um, but there's so much more. You know, this museum still exists. They've got a lot of really incredible artifacts. And it, the museum really tries to tell the history of the church in Mexico. And we've got some students who've done internship work with the museum, and we're really kind of tying um, this um, our relationship closer and closer together. Yeah, Stephanie Griswold is one of those. Correct. I'm trying yeah. to get her on, but she lives down in Short Creek. She and I'm does. Like, <laughs> I always like to do these in person, and I, I'm going to have to make a special trip to Short Creek, I yeah. guess. <laughs> yeah, that might be fun for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, she can show you around. Um, she's doing some, I think, really fascinating work. Um, she's got, you collected a lot of materials and a lot of oral histories on the community down there. Okay. Um, and, and yeah, I think, you know, whatever she ends up producing from it will be, will be really. Well, and she stuff. spoke with Fernando. I didn't realize he's a former general authority. Mm-hmm. He was at Sunstone. Yeah. Is that okay to go to Sunstone? <laughs> I mean, according to who? You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, it seems like uh, mm-hmm. the church really was like, don't, you know, if you're yeah, a BYU yeah, yeah. employee, oh, don't go to Sunstone. Of course. Yeah, if you're a church employee, I've seen some there. there, but <laughs> usually they're like, don't say I'm here. <laughs> you know, when you're emeritus, I suppose, like he is. <laughs> you can do what you want. Yeah. <laughs> well, fantastic. Um, so I'd like to segue a little bit. Uh, you wrote a chapter in a book called Dimensions of Faith. Can you show it to the camera and then talk a little bit about your chapter and, and talk a little bit about the book? It's a fantastic book. Yeah, yeah. So this is an edited collection um, done by... Steve Taysom, who just recently published a really wonderful biography of Joseph F. Smith that he's been working on for years and years and years. I've got too many books to read, but that's (laughs) on my list. I know. We all have too many books to read. Um, He, prior to that, I think his, uh, he was best known for two or three um, other pieces of work. One is um, his dissertation, which he turned into a really excellent monograph. It's a comparison of 19th century Shakers and Mormons. Oh. And thinking about how these two kind of um, small religious movements developed a sense of their boundaries, their relationships with the culture around them, and how they became essentially, well, the book is, you know, the, he uses that word boundaries in the, in the title. Uh, but he also wrote two really excellent articles. One about the shifting memory of polygamy um, in the LDS church over the course of the late 19th, early 20th century and how ideas about polygamy changed. The other one, I'm I'm, I'm not going to remember the title because it's quite long, but the other one is an article about exorcism um, in in LDS history. Um, And that was published in Religion in American Culture, which is a very prestigious academic journal on American religion. But you can see from these, you know, the, the kind of eclectic nature of Taysom's interests, um, certainly. And Dimensions of Faith, I think, this reader that he did is a gathering of a lot of different articles that have already been published in other places, many of them. My article was published in the Journal of Mormon History. 
But what he's trying to do with this book, I think, is introduce readers to not only a variety of topics <laughs> in Mormon history, but also a, a different ways of studying um, religion, right? And so if you look at the table of contents, there are subsections on memory, on media, on theory, on biography, on lived experience, right? All these different ways that you can kind of get at looking at what Mormonism is. Um, my article um, is about Mormon Bigfoot folklore. <laughs> we got to talk <laughs> and, about that. Yeah, and, and this was actually, this is an article I wrote in graduate school. Okay. Um, it was, it's my first real academic publication Okay. Um, ever. It might, I say sometimes this might still be the thing I'm best known for, the, at least <laughs> the thing I get the most email about. I do well, still Well, and I know when emails. they were publishing the book, Bigfoot got a big play, and I remember oh, I'm sure. Tom yeah. Kimball was like, oh, we don't want to only talk about Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a great story. You know, I think, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it's people of a certain age, my age, remember that, that Kane was Bigfoot, or, or yeah. you know, you yeah. can talk about that more. But I think... It's losing its memory, and so mm -hmm. I'm glad you wrote about it. It's a fantastic topic. Yeah, you know, it's something um, – I mean, and this is something I still sort of work on. I just finished a book on UFOs. It's going to be published in a couple of weeks. Um, and, and I think, you know, these sorts of stories, these, um, this folklore, this supernatural folklore that people find kind of fascinating and interesting and all of that, we find it fascinating and interesting uh, because it appeals to us, because it tells us something about who we are. Really, you know, there's there's a sense of being edgy when you think about Bigfoot, when you think about UFOs, but these things catch on, and they catch on for reasons because they resonate with something um, that we want to think about ourselves, and that's kind of the argument of the article, right? I'm you you say right the notion that Bigfoot is Cain or vice versa, Cain is Bigfoot. Um, I argue in the article that this is an association that really. Um, emerges in the 1980s right? Um, in the kind of Mormon corridor, right? Idaho down through Arizona. And that's why I remember hearing about mm -hmm. it because I'm, I'm an 80s child. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, right? And, and, and you have at that moment this intersection of two, an interweaving of two strands of folklore. There had been in the church a long history of Cain, right? Cain was a figure in the history of the church going back to 1835 when David W. Patton, who was then president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Captain Fear Not. Mm -hmm, exactly. He was killed in the Missouri conflicts, right? Um, he claims to have seen Cain. Now, what's I think really interesting about this story is that most members of the church hear this story much later, or at least it's written down much later. It is first put in print in a biography of Patton, written in the 1890s by a guy named Lycurgus Wilson. However, Wil what Wilson does is he reprints letters, and these are letters to and from Joseph F. Smith, who apparently writes to a man named Abraham Smoot, Okay. Um, you know, the Smoots, right? And Abraham Smoot, of course, is a significant figure in his own right. He's mayor of Salt Lake for a while. Also a slaveholder. Right, as we know. Um, Smoot writes to Joseph F. Smith and says, here's the story. And this is 50 years after the fact, right? And so Smoot's letter is reprinted in this biography of David W. Pat uh, biography of David W. Patton. It's then later reprinted in part in Spencer Kimball's book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, which is where it gains a lot of traction, right? Because that's a really big book in the 70s exactly. and 80s. Um, now, Smoot says when he was a little boy, Patton was staying with his family while he's serving a mission in Tennessee, and Patton came home one day, white as a sheet, and says essentially that um, he had seen Cain. Um, and uh, he was riding his horse through the forest, and Cain, Cain came out of the woods, Patton says he's near, he was nearly as tall as I was when I was sitting on the back of my horse. He was covered with dark hair. So if he's sitting on a horse, this yeah, guy's like nine yeah, feet tall, precisely, right? Precisely. And Patton says, who are you? And he says, I am Cain, who slew my brother Abel. And Patton learns that Cain is cursed to wander the earth, and he's trying to destroy the souls of men. That's a quotation. And then Patton 
says, like, cast him out by the authority of the priesthood. Wow. Now, so that's the, that's a story. And, and there are, I think, hints that this story cir- was circulating uh, in the church in the 19th century. Eliza Arsenal writes a poem in which she mentions this mm-hmm. um, story before the publication of that biography. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a matter of tracking down these little snippets and trying to piece together if this story was known, if it was told, and it appears that it was. Um, there is another account in the church history library, um, which is filed under um, the title Encounters with Cain, No Date. And it is an account of E. Wesley Smith, who was a son of Joseph F. Smith, um, who claims to have encountered Cain while he is serving in the Hawaiian mission in the 1920s. And he says it's the night before the dedication of the, of the Laie Hawaii Temple, um, and Cain came into his office, and he casts Cain out again with the authority of the priesthood. And again, he describes Cain as being, you know, nine feet tall. He says he has to duck his head to get through the doorway, covered with dark hair, and Smith commands him to depart by the authority of the priesthood. And he leaves. So when was the Hawaii temple dedicated? Was that in the 50s? We're talking early, ni- early 1920s. Oh, 1920s. Yes. Is that all? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, you know, these, these stories are circulating, right? But the, And so there's, there's this folkloric tradition of encounters with Cain. And Cain is depicted um, in the history of the church in a couple of ways. The first is he's a representative of Satan, right? And he is an example of the real kind of tangible nature of spiritual evil. That it, you know, evil is not simply doing bad things, right? There are supernatural forces out there trying to stop the church, um, trying to destroy the church. That's why Cain appears when he appears at the dedication of temples. He appears to apostles, right? He, he's an adversary. Um, but, and increasingly so, I think, as this folklore progresses through the 19th century, um, Cain is also, of course, the progenitor of African people. Mm-hmm. Um, and he be, and now this is not simply in the church, right? There's a long history going back to the Puritans, if not before, of depicting Satan, Cain, these demonic figures as black, um, as you know, the, the ancestors of the black race. And this becomes increasingly pronounced, I think, in the late 19th, early 20th century, as the church is beginning to proselyte in the southern states mission. Um, as their missionaries are encountering more and more black people. Um, there are stories in the BYU folklore archives in, in the early 20th, early and mid 20th century um, of missionaries encountering Cain in the South, um, Cain being black skinned, um, which is something that becomes more and more pronounced in the folklore um, as you move into the 20th century. The fact that he has black skin becomes increasingly um, important. Because um, that was the mark, right? Right, precisely, precisely, right? This is part that of the God justification. God cursed him with black skin. Yeah. Now, although, you know, Genesis does not say that. Genesis simply says that a mark was placed on Cain. It becomes part of the folklore, right, that that mark is black skin. Right. Um, and this goes, you know, there, there, there's a lot of early modern um, racial theorizing that Europeans are doing, um, dividing up the quote unquote races, right, and saying, right, that the Asian people are the descendant of this person, um, Semitic people are the descendants of this people, Africans are the descendants of this people. It often goes back to the children of, of Noah, right. right, the three children of Noah, and then Cain through that. And of course, Ham, Shem, and Jacob, right, right, precisely. And of course, you know, the Pearl of Great Price um, notes. The marriage, right, and kind of links these these children of Noah back to Cain, particularly. Um, so this becomes a so Ham was a descendant of Cain, essentially. They're the black race, right? Ham's wife in the well in the Pearl of Great oh, is Price, his wife? right? His wife is Egyptus. Okay, um, because there's the curse of Ham and the curse of Cain. Right. Is and, and, that because Ham married a black woman? Theoretically, so there, there, there's a lot of. It's not clear in the book of Genesis, right? And right. so what we're dealing with here is a lot of extrapolations from the book of Genesis as early modern Christians, European Christians, are trying to explain different races. Um, so you have the curse of Cain, which is a mark. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's unclear what it is, but a mark was placed on Cain in Genesis. And, you know, many people... It's extrapolated to be black to skin. To be black skin, yes. Um, but then you have Ham, the son of Noah, who is the son who mocks his father right. while his father is drunk, 
while his other sons care for their father. And then Ham is cursed to be a serpent. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, right, Europe. So that explains say, slavery. Precisely. Yeah, Europeans will say, well, then this explains slavery, and Ham must therefore be the ancestor of African peoples. And it's kind of backward reasoning there, right? Um, but that is, and so the presumption is, well, Ham must have had black skin too because of this. Or according to the Pearl of Great Price, he married someone with black skin, right, right. which is what brought mm-hmm. black people from yeah. Cain, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now it's actually not it, even the Pearl Price is not that clear with black skin. It doesn't assert that, but it does say right. It, it doesn't use those words, right. uh, but that connection is made, and, and so you can extrapolate from it if you want to. Well, and I don't uh, want to get too far away, but there's mm-hmm. Egyptus too, right? And that's that's yeah, the daughter of Pharaoh, right? right? Exactly. Um, and well, <laughs> of course, right. The, the extrapolation is these people because she's the daughter of Pharaoh. Africans are black, therefore, right? Even though, you know, whether or not ancient Egyptians were black is, well, likely they were not. Right. Uh, but, but, of course, that's under dispute. So all of this is to say, right, there's this long kind of um, folklore lineage discussion of Cain um, in LDS folklore. And he becomes then, Cain becomes a figure in which this sort of the racialization um, the white people are doing, their racial theorizing, and this idea of supernatural, tangible evil become interwoven with each other. Um, so but then, Shem, oh, is, you said, was he was the father of Semitic people, so the Middle Eastern people. Japheth. Oh, is Japheth. Yeah. Oh, because I was, okay, so Japheth, and then who? And so there, there's three sons, right? Ham, Shem, Japheth, three primary races. Right. Um, Africans, Semites, Asians. Okay. Um, now, yeah. And, and so and Asians it, are descendants of it, it, Japheth? It, it, or sh- it, it's, it's never terribly clear. Sometimes <laughs> you'll have different associations. Sometimes it will be Shem is the ancestor of Semitics. Japheth is the ancestor of Asians. Sometimes it will be the other way around. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, where Caucasians come in is another question, right? And and all of this is to say, right, What you, what's happening in, in early, the early modern world is this attempt to map um, these very simple biblical stories onto a very complicated reality <laughs> and trying to link um, these different races to different biblical figures. Mm-hmm. And depending on which theorist you read, which early modern theorist you read, it will work in different ways. <laughs> um, All right. Um, oh, but yes, Bigfoot. So the other major strain of folklore here is Bigfoot, right? Bigfoot folklore, which... Um, it goes back pretty far, too. You will find stories of, quote-unquote, wild men um, in, all, in folklore of all different sorts of people around the world. You know, people who are uncivilized, who live in the forest, um, who we encounter sometimes. I mean, if you want to take it all the way back, you can go to the Epic of Gilgamesh and see oh, the really? figure of Enkidu, who is, you know, who is sent to Gilgamesh and who is a wild creature who lives in the forest. Um, and then a lot, oftentimes this wild man folklore um, is a story of civilization, right? You have this wild creature who lives out in the woods who eventually encounters civilization and becomes civilized. Um, and this creature is frightening often because it is a creature that resists civilization, that kind of lurks at the, at the edges of our societies and threatens to tear it down, right? Um, now, Native Americans speak about about peoples like this. Um, Europeans do as well. And by the 19th century, you get stories. Um, well, the, I mean, one of the most famous accounts is in a book by Theodore Roosevelt, um, the future president, in which he, you know, it's a book about about hunting and living in the wilderness, and he describes a man who encountered a great wild ape-like creature in the forests of North America. Mm-hmm. Um, so the story is really circulating, right? And by the 19, or by I'm sorry, by the 20th century, there are two emerging, two kind of primary strands in Bigfoot folklore. One is the scientific strand. Um, these are researchers and scholars of Bigfoot. Um, the most prominent of whom I discuss in the essay is a man named John Green, um, and then. Um, as well, a couple of actual anthropologists, Grover Krantz is a, fa- is a famous one, and Jeffrey Meldrum, who's actually a member of the LDS Church, 
um, who teaches at a university up in Idaho, these people argue that Bigfoot is simply an animal. It's a creature. It's an ape uh, that human beings are related to the same way human beings are related to chimpanzees and gorillas, and we just haven't found it yet. But it's it's just an animal. And the it's missing out there. link, maybe. Who knows, right? <laughs> um, the other strand um, is our supernaturalists. They would argue that Bigfoot is not just an animal. That Bigfoot is a alien creature, an interdimensional creature, a supernatural creature of one type. Which um, is why we can't catch him. Precisely. And those people might say that there's actually only one out there. It's not a species, right? It's it's a special kind of um, supernatural creature. So this debate is raging among scholars of Bigfoot um, in the mid-20th century. Can you put those um, two words together, scholars <laughs> of Bigfoot? <laughs> well, hopefully that's what I am. But... <laughs> um, <laughs> But then in the 1980s, all of this comes together in Utah because there's a rash of Bigfoot sightings in Utah. Okay. Um, up, particularly up in northern Utah around Ogden, North Davis County. Okay. There's a famous sighting there. I grew up in Ogden, so oh, that explains a there you go. You may have heard of it. Yeah. And it gets in the newspapers, right? And it's in the it's in the Salt Lake Tribune, it's in the Desert News. And these people, you know, there's two or three sightings over the course of a, of a month or two, and I think really critically, that happens at almost exactly the same time as a couple of other developments in the church. The first is the revocation of the priesthood and temple ban in 1978, mm -hmm. which begins to make the sort of overt racializations, the, the, the purposes that Cain was serving prior to that, more uncomfortable for some white members of the church, um, right? The, Cain is no longer serving that sort of function anymore. The other thing that happens, of course, is the publication of Spencer Kimball's book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, which contains the David Patton story in it. Oh, wow. So all three of these things happen at about the same time um, and you start to see, and I, I would see this as I'm going through the folklore archives at Utah State University and at BYU, there are faculty members and students of both those universities who often collect folklore from the students, right? They'll, the faculty who teach folklore classes will send their students out and say, go gather folk stories, right? Talk to your friends, talk to your peers, ask them about for folk tales, and they'll get them and then they'll archive them. And so you can trace in some ways the evolution of folklore over time. What st stories are students telling um, that appears in these archives? And I saw beginning in the mid-1980s, increasingly this conflation happening. Students saying Bigfoot is actually Cain. Cain is actually Bigfoot, um, right? And thus the that is a way, I think, for students, especially younger students, right, who are increasingly uncomfortable with the earlier function of Cain saying he's the archetypical cursed black man. Um, they're, they're pushing that in a different direction. What they're saying now is Cain is Bigfoot, and Bigfoot is a monster. And he's so this a, is to avoid the racism of calling Cain a black man? I think... To some extent, right, it may not be overt. It's hard to track why these people are doing it. What I do know is that the racialization of Cain starts to drop out from stories of Bigfoot told in the 80s and 90s. Hmm. Instead, they're telling stories of Cain being Bigfoot, but Cain acts like Bigfoot. <laughs> you know, and in some of this earlier folklore, like when Cain meets David W. Patton, when he meets Wesley Smith in these folk tales, he's intelligent. He talks. He tells them who he is. He says, I've come to destroy the work of the church. By the stories by the stories I'm seeing in the 80s and 90s about Bigfoot, identifying him as Cain, he acts like a big gorilla. He doesn't speak anymore. He roars. He chases you through the woods. Um, his, He's not here to destroy the church. His skin color is mentioned less and less. It's still there sometimes, but often he's described not as being black or dark-skinned. He's described as being big and hairy like a gorilla, like an ape. Mm -hmm. Now, certainly some of that kind of residue, right, of the animalization of black people is still there, but it's not as overt anymore. Okay. Um, instead, that conflation, I think, happens as a way to try to push the folklore in a different direction. Huh. Very interesting. I never thought of it as a way to get rid of the racism mm -hmm. of the previous... Mm -hmm. Thanks, sir. And it's fun to see kind of the 
conflation of Mormon doctrine with Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, right? And th this is actually something that um, scholars of folklore have noted for a long time, that folklore is one vector by which these sort of small um, cultural communities, these fairly insulated cultural communities, become intertwined with broader American culture. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Matt Bowman, the Mormon Studies Chair at Claremont Graduate University. In our next conversation, we're going to turn from Bigfoot to UFOs. I saw so, something on, I want to say, formerly the History Channel, mm -hmm. because it seems like, the well, they have the Ancient Aliens. The Ancient Aliens, yes. And there, there was one about uh, a, an alien in, from... And it wasn't Kolob, it was some other weird place that came to Joseph Smith, and so it wasn't an angel, it was an alien. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, where do they get this garbage? <laughs> yeah. It comes largely from a man named Eric von Däniken, um, who is a, he's Swiss, um, he's a hotel manager. And in the late 1960s, he publishes a book called Chariots of the Gods. And this book argues that not simply Joseph Smith, but more or less every prophetic figure throughout human history was either an extraterrestrial or inspired by extraterrestrials. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, subscribe on either Patreon or at gospeltangents.com. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire audio uninterrupted. On our $10 tier, if you'd like to see the whole video, you can see that uh, either on youtube.com slash gospel tangents, or I've got a special Facebook group devoted for uh, full videos. So subscribe at gospeltangents.com and uh, sign up for just $10 a month. For $20 a month, if you'd like to get some bonus content, uh, maybe some of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor, you can sign up for that. And then if you'd like to talk to me for $100 a month, we'll, we'll do a monthly phone call on something like Zoom, and you can ask me anything you want. So thanks again. Also, don't forget about the merch, mugs, t-shirts, um, hats, things like that. I'm trying to get the ties up there. Hopefully I can get up, up there. And uh, thanks again for watching Gospel Tangents. And click here for some more videos.